I'm actually in the sanctuary uh, just a few days earlier to do a pre-recorded service for Gale Presbyterian Church for May 9th. We are with our uh, pandemic uh, protocols and the uh, church is not open to the public at this point, but we're very blessed with the technology, with the expertise and with great volunteer people to be able to put together this worship service pre-recorded to uh, go live on our YouTube channel on May 9th. Hey, we're glad that you're able to join us, either right at the time that it's going premiering on Sunday morning or sometime other later on in the week, whatever uh, works for you. Another one of the hidden blessings, I guess, of, uh, of, of our pandemic is that uh, well, we don't get together all in one place all at one time, but we have the variety and the freedoms, the, be, the ability to uh, engage with this worship at whatever time that is good for us. I welcome you to this time of worship. I pray that you will find this time meaningful and spiritual and good for you and that it makes your day, your week, your life better having been here for this. We come into this time of worship considering, hearing and considering the words of Psalm number 98. Oh, sing a new song. Sing to the Lord, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Bring forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands and the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. With these words and with these sentiments in our hearts and souls, let us come to worship God. We begin this worship too with the singing of number 371 in our hymn book, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
minds and our souls in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, the power of your love is beyond our comprehension. The breadth of your compassion is beyond our ability to measure. In Jesus Christ, you have met us in the midst of life's joys and challenges and shown us what it means to love and to be loved. You have entrusted us with the greatest commandment to love one another as Christ has loved us. In this time of worship, we offer you our love and our loyalty, seeking to learn more of what love and loyalty mean for us in the midst of our joys and challenges. Receive our prayers and our praise, and through the power of your Spirit, draw us closer to you and closer to each other as friends and followers of Christ, the risen Lord. Merciful God, we confess we often find it difficult to love others as you have commanded, and though we intend to do your will, our priorities lead us in other directions. We seek our own security before the well-being of others. We fulfill our own desires rather than act for the common good. We justify our own interests and fail to understand the cost they take on the earth and other people. Forgive us, Lord. Redirect our priorities and renew our commitment to live out your love, even when it demands more of us than we expect. Lord, hear our prayers. My friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news, believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Mother's Love by Carol Matthews. A mother's love right from the start. She holds her baby close to her heart. The bond that grows will never falter. Her love is so strong it will never alter. A mother gives never-ending love. She never feels that she's given enough. 
for she will always do her best, constantly working, there's no time to rest. A mother is there when things go wrong, a hug and a kiss to help us along, always there when we need her near, gently wiping our eyes when we shed a tear. A mother's prayer means so very much, believing in God and his gentle touch, keeping you safe both day and night. Your mother's prayer will time it just right. So on this day, shower your mother with love. Gifts and presents are nice, but that is not enough. Give your mother a day to have some peace of mind. Be gentle, be good, be helpful, be kind. A prayer for our mothers. All loving God, we give you thanks and praise for mothers young and old. We pray for young mothers who give life and count toes and tend to our every need. May they be blessed with patience and tenderness to care for their families and themselves with great joy. We pray for our own mothers who have nurtured and cared for us. May they continue to guide in strong and gentle ways. We remember mothers who are separated from their children because of war, poverty, or conflict. May they feel the loving embrace of our God who wipes away every tear. We pray for women who are not mothers, but still love and shape us with motherly care and compassion. We remember mothers, grandmothers, and great-grandmothers who are no longer with us, but who will live forever in our memory and nourish us with their love. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 8, and verses 44 to 48. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, the centurion of a band of soldiers called the Italian Detachment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave many alms to the people and continually prayed to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, when he looked at him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who continually waited on him. When he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. And from verse 44, <clears throat> while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. All the believers of the circumcision who had come with Peter were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they had heard them speaking in other tongues and magnifying God. And from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do with these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I have said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound 
but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. May God bless these readings from his holy word. Our next hymn is number 389, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. things that we've lost during a pandemic and during lockdown and during closure of the church. Well, even when we had the church open, something that we weren't doing was getting the choir together over there or getting the choir together down in the, uh, in the music room downstairs in preparation for the worship. You all know that I do copious amounts of research and study and preparation just to get a sermon ready for these services, but you might not be as aware that uh, Rick McFadden and all of the members of that wonderful choir we've got do a lot of preparation too, not just their practices on Thursday evening, but always whipping in a little bit of a, 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 an update or a, a, a recap on Sunday morning before church. I've been a member of a choir every now and then, and I, although I sometimes do sing with the choir here or with the praise band on occasion, I, I know one of the important elements of preparation for a choir 
is the exercises they do at the beginning, before they even start into the music. They, they go through some, some la 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 and, and you know, not really exciting stuff. But another important part of preparation for that choir is getting in that breath. And so much of good music, good singing, is, well, sure, based on having a good singing voice for one thing, but also having good breath control. And any good choir director will make sure that they practice that breath control before they get into doing the actual nuts and bolts of singing. <sighs> Breathe in. Get it good, get it full, and then be able to breathe it out in control. And while breathing it out, put a little music in the song. And you see, I didn't breathe well enough there to be able to carry out the singing voice that I wanted to do there. Breathe, breathe, breathe. And when they do that breath practice, when they do that breathing exercise, I maintain that's a little bit of a holiness to it. There's a, there's a certain sense of, of, uh, of sanctity in the breath, not just for the fact that you're getting ready to sing some holy music or, 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 or present some, some, some holy oration if, in, in the case of, of, of the minister, whatever, but there's something very holy and important in breath. And I brought this up before, I know, many times because of what breath really is or at least the imagery that we get from breath that comes from our language, our linguistics. And it's not so prominent, it's not so obvious in the English language, one of the things we've lost. But in both the Hebrew language and the Greek language, the two um, um, languages that our scriptures are based upon, in both the Hebrew and the Greek, that word for breath, it's the same word that is used for spirit. It's also the same word that is used for wind. <sighs> oh, you know, Rick and I and, and, and Kim and anybody else who was out there in the early days of us pre-recording these services, and you would know this, and I think maybe you can even go back in our YouTube channel and, and see this for yourselves. The wind had much to do, as it had as much to do with the, uh, the, the sermonizing and, and, and the praying as did the actual words. Because before we got our technology in place, our hardware updated and stuff, you could hear that wind blowing over the microphone. The wind and the breath and the Spirit of God. The same word is being used in those languages, Hebrew and Greek, to mean the same thing. So you can envision, too, where those words show up and become very important in our scripture, right at the very beginning. It says, in the beginning when God began to create and the Spirit of God flowed over the waters or blew over the waters, the Spirit, you can just envision a wind moving. And, and I can see, if I was making a movie of it, this nice little ripple I would make in the water. Ripples caused by wind, ripples caused by spirit, ripples caused by the breath of God and the Spirit of God moving into creation. And then that Spirit moving through the whole of the history of God's people. A showing up in great tempest and great storm, Christ on the, uh, the, 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 the Sea of Galilee scene. Hey, have you been watching a really neat Netflix show right now? Is, uh, um, this is a robbery, and it's a documentary about an incredible art heist and it, uh, uh, in the uh, late 1990s, and it had, early 1990s, and it has one of the, in, in, one of the most important uh, pictures that was stolen was, uh, was one called uh, The Sea of Galilee. Galilee, and it's an image of, uh, of, of Christ, uh, you know, calm and reserved and, and maybe even asleep in the back of the boat while the 12 disciples are, are wrestling with this humongous wind storm and, and, uh, and, and thunder that's going on. In the, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible picture. Look for it. Google it if you want to get a really good image of what wind and storm can do. And when wind and storm are seen in that picture, I also, when I'm seeing that uh, picture in that documentary, I got this in the back of my mind, that that wind is the breath of God. 
and even the breath of God throwing that boat around on the Sea of Galilee, knowing that everything's going to be okay because Christ is there, God is there. In the breath, in the wind, the Spirit is there. We use that image of wind and breath and spirit a lot, not just in our choir getting ready, but, but in the things that we, we, we do in, in church. And I think that image is important to us. That, and, and I think it's important that we grasp the, the relationship between those three things, the breath and the wind and the spirit. Because when we do see the interconnectivity of the, the uh, uh, that, that, that word, oh, I guess I could tell you, the, the, I think in the Hebrew the word is ruch, uh, and it's a weird spelling when you put it into English, R-U, and then you throw up an apostrophe, and I think A and a C-H, and then in the Greek it's pneuma, uh, which is a silent P, <laughs> N-U, I better not try, and spell. you know, I, do, I did write it down, I should look at my notes every now and then, they're really good, uh, but I, I'm not going to find it immediately. Pneuma, pneuma, which we use, it shows up in our uh, English language, sort of like a, in a pneumatic tire, that word that's filled with air, it's filled with breath, it's filled with wind. Um, but uh, I, I don't want to talk about tires so much. I do want to talk about ruach and pneuma and how that, those words in the Hebrew and, and Greek have such an impact upon our spirituality now. If you think about it, how long do you have to live if you stop breathing? I saw this interesting poster once. It says that every human being is just two minutes away from dying. But every time you take a breath, you reset the clock. Breath to us is life-giving. Breath to us, without it, we are not alive. And if we equate breath with the Spirit of God, do you not see the connection there? Without breath, we are not alive. Without the Spirit of God, we are not alive. Wind that blows all around us, and that's part of one of the uh, elements of, of the creation, certainly, is that the fact that that wind keeps moving around the whole globe. And it's because of that wind moving around the globe, and my gosh, sometimes it really makes me angry. I have never been in a more windy location than I have been here in Elmira. I kind of think that the winds come blowing off of Lake Huron, and there's nothing to stop it between Lake Huron and my house on Brookmead Street in Elmira, because sometimes I open up that door and it gets smashed against the side of the house. I can't stop that from happening. And that's another important thing about that wind, that spirit. We don't stop it. It blows where it wants to blow, and it blows with a ferocity that it wants to blow. And we don't stop it. And that Spirit of God, it goes where it wants to go, and it goes with a ferocity that it wishes to go with. And we don't stop it. But it's not always forced. It's not always forceful. It's not always so violent, is it? And likewise, in one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament that comes to us in, uh, in, in, in the Kings, 1 Kings chapter 19, when Elijah is, uh, is, is hiding out on a mountain and he's hiding from God. He thinks he's done everything he can and people are trying to kill him and he just wants to become a hermit and stay away from everything. But then on that mountain, there's a great crash, a great thunder, a great blast of wind and the rocks are, are, are broken. Yeah, but the scripture tells us, but, but God was not in the wind, not in that time. And then later on, after a couple of other incidents, there's a still, small voice, a still, small uh, breath that comes to Elijah on that mountain. And it's in that breath that God speaks, in the, in the silent, the still, small voice. But power in that still small voice, because it is in that still small voice that God empowers Elijah of what he should be doing next and instructs him to go back down off of this mountain and gives him a few tasks to perform before his final days on this earth. The wind can be powerful. The wind can be a still small voice. And God's voice is in that. The breath of God, the breath of our lives, keeping us going, and that is the Spirit of God. 
Now the Holy Spirit shows up in this reading that Jeanette gave us. This story about Peter going to the house of Cornelius. And Cornelius has this dream, and that's always something important. To, when things come to people in a dream, that's the Spirit of God speaking to them in a way that the Spirit can. Uh, just in this same uh, section of the Bible, this, a dream comes to Peter too, which uh, uh, the, the dream that Peter gets is the one that sort of opens up the whole of this gospel story to all people, not just to the Jewish nation, but to all people. And Cornelius is, is the first example of this where his family, who are not of the Jewish faith, but are baptized into this new thing, this new uh, spirit, this, this new, I don't want to call it a religion at the time, but this new community, this new understanding of God. And Cornelius and his family are baptized. And I say it's momentous here how the Spirit moved to bring these dreams to the people and to bring this baptism to the people. And, uh, and, and, and that's what really gets the whole of our Christianity going, opening up, opening up God's kingdom to all people, not just those who were born of a particular race. We have seen this spirit then. We have seen this wind blow through in many subtle and quiet ways and in many huge and fantastic ways. And we have seen this wind, we have seen this spirit create so many good things and destroy so many good things too through the centuries after it showed up to Peter and Cornelius in that way. The Holy Spirit, it's a big thing. Big enough to be able to choose to show itself in really small ways. This great big gust of wind can move small things to powerful expression. One of these expressions is the baptism that is told about in this story of Cornelius. One of these expressions is the communion where we, 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 we celebrate as a community. And we'll be doing that again in following our, our pandemic protocols in a few weeks. One of these expressions is just in the Presbyterian tradition which has made this congregation, this community possible at the same time making so many other communities possible too. Someday maybe this uncontrollable wind will tip over that jar of Welch's grape juice and we'll see something interesting and new and different in our community. Sometimes this uncontrollable wind may come into your world and into your family and into your life and do something that completely changes things. And it might be for the worse and it might be for the better because we know that that wind that Spirit of God, that breath of God, is uncontrollable. But it is God's. And we have to kind of accept that where that wind can, when that wind blows our, our, our blue boxes two blocks away, and we can be irritated about that, but it's uncontrollable. And we can see in it, though, the blessing that things are moving in God's direction, with God's Spirit, with God's breath, and not so much our own. Things like that will happen because these are the Holy Spirit's symbols, images, not ours. Maybe if we stand back and we just sort of let the wind blow where it will, we will find ourselves even more rooted in the Spirit of God, in the wind, in the breath of God. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Well, I don't know when it is that you are observing this service. It might be Sunday, May 9th, or it might not be till sometime later in the week, but it's supposed to be Sunday, May 9th, Mother's Day. And we'd like to uh, have a special recognition uh, of that at this time. And so Rick has prepared a special time of reflection uh, in honor of Mother's Day today. <laughs>
Once again, we gather in a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of our lives and our loving, we thank you for the signs of resurrection that are all around us, showing that life is stronger than death. Give us the grace to recognize and embrace the gifts of new life that your love makes possible for us all. As we pray for your resurrecting power to renew the world amid all of its challenges. God of home and family, today we thank you for families, especially our mothers and our grandmothers. We are grateful for their love and attention, their hard work and the deep hope that they have cherished for each one of us. We honour before you each mother, grandmother and great-grandmother whom we hold in our hearts. And we pray for all of those who have felt isolated from their families because of months of pandemic. Reunite us in your love. Lord, hear our prayers. God of compassion, today we thank you for friends and relations, for neighbours and fellow citizens who make our lives complete. We thank you for smiles shared, for helping hands offered, for commitments honoured. And we pray for all of those around us who are facing particular challenges that we know of this day. God of courage, today we pray for all of those who have felt life or love slipping through their fingers in the time of distancing that we've had to endure. And for those who have struggled with their physical or mental health, whatever the reason. We pray for communities trying to sort out how to recover from a pandemic and for all of those worried about their personal future. Lord, hear our prayers. God of forgiveness and renewal, today we pray for those whose relationships are in need of repair and for all who work for peace and reconciliation in the face of deep divisions. We pray for families, churches, communities and countries facing conflict and ask that your spirit open hearts and minds to deeper understanding. Lord, hear our prayers. As friends and followers of Jesus, we offer the words that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We think of all of the things that we have been able to do and all of the things that we have been able to give to see that God's love is in us and expressed through us. We have been able to donate money to our church or to other social services and charities in our community, helping all through these troubling and difficult times. And we think of the conversations that we have had uplifting our friends and our neighbours and our relations. Think of all of the things that you have done to show that Christ's love is in you. And think on those things as we sing our doxology in response and in thanksgiving.
as part of the life and mission moment at Gale Church this morning. As your clerk of session, I wish to read to you a letter from the Presbytery of Waterloo, Wellington. To the members and, here and adherents of Gale Presbyterian Church, Reverend Scott Sinclair of this congregation, having laid his application to retire from the ministry of the Presbyterian Church in Canada before the Presbytery of Waterloo, Wellington, the said Presbytery cite the session and congregation to appear at the meeting of the Presbytery to be held via Zoom video conference on the 11th of May, 2021 at 7 p.m. Those who may wish to give reasons why the Reverend Scott Sinclair's application should not be accepted with certification that if no appearance be made, the congregation shall be held as consenting to Reverend Sinclair's retirement effective July 1st, 2021. In order to facilitate this citation, the session of Gale Presbyterian Church is asked to appoint two or three representatives to attend and when called upon to speak briefly to the Presbytery. Respectfully, Reverend Daryl Clark, Clerk Presbytery of Waterloo, Wellington. I wish to add to this that on behalf of session, Jeanette Baumhoff and Diane Kuhlman will be appearing at this meeting. And if any of you wish to do so also, would you please get in touch with me and I will make sure that you get the Zoom link for that meeting. Thank you. Our closing hymn will be number 399, Spirit of Gentleness.
Having joined in this worship, it is my prayer that we have been blessed, blessed for this day and for all the days yet to come. Now let us rise from this time of worship and go out into that great world, knowing that we go certainly with spirit, with God's spirit, with God's breath, with God's wind blowing us where it will. The love of God, the grace and the compassion of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us always. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.